Malcolm Beeson Conservation Centre at the Royal Air Force Museum. Um, what I'm going to do this morning is just talk to you uh, about museum work uh, and this is not what you see on a day-to-day -day basis uh, going on in a, in a museum, the objects. What I'm going to talk to you about mainly is what's going on behind the scenes and that's uh, the role that uh, I play at the museum. Myself, I was uh, in the Armed Forces and the RAF. I did serve for 26 years uh, as an aircraft engineer and that's the uh, main types of aircraft uh, I worked on throughout my career. A couple of tours on the uh, the Queen of the Skies, of VC-10, uh, on the real squadron as well, 10 squadron, just in case there's anybody out listening who's been on 101. Um, Phantoms, uh, quite a long time, seven years on Phantoms, including uh, the tour down in the Falkland Islands, which is a lovely place to visit. Uh, and again, you can see Hawk and, and Jag. Jag was quite a, an interesting time because uh, I was involved with the Jag upgrades, which was in 95, 97. So that was bringing the Jaguar aircraft up to operate, uh, well, NATO operational readiness uh, standards. As you can see in the bottom right, there's a Jaguar in the background. That's uh, me in the middle in the uh, in the green suit, uh, having a, a flight in an Omani Air Force Jaguar. I spent just under two years actually in Oman as a project manager for the upgrade of their Jaguar fleet. Amazing place. Uh, we had 20 minutes of rain in two years that I was out there. Incredible. Uh, but yes, uh, my thank you present was a backseat uh, flight uh, over the desert. Quite incredible. Got to point nine five on the Mac. So I didn't quite break the sound barrier, but quite what a what a thrill that was. Uh, so I mentioned I'm the manager of the Michael Beeson Conservation Centre, and that's a photo there of uh, Sir Michael. He was a uh, Lancaster pilot in the Second World War, but then went on to become uh, chief of the uh, air staff. So the top rank in the RAF, and he actually went to the top rank as well. Not everybody is chief of air staff and makes it that far. They normally fall one uh, rank short. But you can see the other things he was involved with. Um, it was his idea for us uh, during the Falkland War that we could bomb Stanley with a Vulcan. Everybody else thought it was ludicrous, but as you know, uh, that went ahead and happened. Um, Bill, they, they brought the tornado into the ser into service, something that just retired in the last few years. And something that the, all three, all the armed forces rely on now is the build up of the reserve forces. He put that into uh, uh, process it in, into the RAF. <clears throat> so that's who the building was named after and opened in 2002. Uh, and we like to think we're a uh, place where we safeguard military avian aviation history. So that's what we're after here, and talking about here, not uh, civil aviation and a war winner centre of excellence. Hopefully by the end of our talk, which will take about 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how much I can remember. I've got no notes in front of me. Um, hopefully you'll agree that and uh, maybe pop along and see us at some point. <clears throat> so this is a museum. Our purpose is to tell the story of the RAF and that's through its people and, and the collections. We've got an amazing collection uh, at two sites. Um, and we're part of the National Collection, so we're one of the free museums. Uh, all you've got to do is pay for parking, and um, I've got it on my last slide. We have just reopened a couple, uh, the 6th of last week, was yes, so Monday last week. Um, you can come back to the museum now, start looking around. It's all done via online booking, so if you do wish to come and see either the site, please just um, go online, book your arrival slot, and have been in working on uh, the, the front of the house team, and it is a very, very safe place for you and the family to go. All the staff there are well back away from you and they're all wearing um, PPE masks and things like that. Anyway, getting back onto the talk. Um, so really, as being a national museum, the objects we have uh, are owned by the nation. They're owned by everybody. So we don't own them. We are just the carers. So I am responsible for the care of the large 3D objects. And by large 3D planes, trains, airplanes, helicopters, anything like that, anything large. Um, someone's asked me many times how... how um, small we start from and to be truthful with you if it's anything mechanical so even something like a watch if the museum wanted it to be back working or uh, operational or us just to have a general look at it and give it a servicing i'm sure uh, my team which includes uh, staff paid staff volunteers and apprentices i'm sure we'd be willing to just to have a little play around and see what we can do so yes we're not really limited to the large object but that's our major role so my remit is really sorry i've slipped on the slide a bit quick there um, the easiest way to explain my role then is just to make sure that the Spitfires, Hurricanes, the Messerschmitts and things like that that we have on our collection at both sites are still there in 50, 100 years time. A couple of ways we can do that. We don't fly any of our objects and we certainly don't ground run. You reduce flying and ground running, that reduces a lot of the risk. So therefore you can keep them as original as possible. I think in the UK uh, with the flying units like the Battle of Britain, Memorial Flight and the other groups out there, we have a great mixture of flying aircraft or vintage uh, aircraft and um, the uh, original ones that we have in our museum that are on display. The easiest thing for us to do is just to get one from the, uh, an object from the RAF, an aircraft come in, 
put some chocks in, take all the fuel, disconnect uh, all the nasties on board, hydraulic fluids and things like that, and then just put her on display and leave her. Uh, and as long as she stays there not deteriorating, we're doing the job that we're paid to do. Uh, we do the inspections. Um, so that's the sort of thing I'm going to talk about, how we go about some of these tasks, because it's not as straightforward as it, it sounds like just chucking some chocks in and taking the fuel out. As a national museum, um, we're overseen by a lot of people. As you can see, there's a list there. I don't want to bore you too much with that. Um, but obviously then we've got the health and safety and all that sort of side of it to look after. Um, and here's the building. This is us. If you've ever been to the Cosford site, um, been through the display hangars, you wouldn't have seen us. We're out the back in this purpose-built building, which I say was opening in 2002. Top right uh, photo there shows you the uh, hangar floor. And to be honest with you, I wish it looked like that now. It certainly doesn't. It's absolutely jam-packed full of uh, exhibits and objects, uh, quite large ones as well. Um, if anybody is interested, uh, that's a... Uh, an LVG C6 bottom, the wooden aeroplane, the, the bathtub is sort of about halfway up on the left hand side, that's a Morris Farman, uh, that's a lightning and a javelin in the background. And the bottom right photo there is a training centre that we have, uh, it's housing a couple of other departments now but initially it was built for use by our apprenticeship scheme and I'll talk a little bit more about the apprentices uh, in a short while. So what do we do? all these fancy words that you hear thrown around and to be truthful we can sit here for an hour probably talking about the four of them and the differences but quite typically it differs between museums and their take on it but this is the sort of work we do conservation is really probably the number one and by that i mean just leave it for as long as possible as original as, uh, as original as possible um bespoke lifting jacking transportation you can see there's a lifting operation going on there of a Junkers 88 uh, that was delivered from our Hendon Museum up to the uh, Hendons in London up to the Cosford site uh, and again if you can think about it all these aeroplanes and I think between both sites we've got around about 180 aeroplanes just, just, just aeroplanes on display uh, if we have to have all the support equipment or the lifting tackle or the jacks and trestles we'd need a another museum the size of Hendon or Cosford uh, just to store it all so we have general equipment like the slings and things like that and uh, we have to look at how they would have been lifted in the day and adapt uh, to do this safe lifting uh, so yes it's a lot of uh, thought goes into how we're going to lift these objects and a lot of uh, care because the last thing we want to do is to do any damage to any of these objects but this is the sort of thing um, we get involved with quite regularly and one of the big things that we do obviously is prepare aeroplanes and get them ready for display and sometimes some of your aeroplanes are quite big uh, so rather than try and build a put the wings and engines on on something like this liberator in inside a hangar uh, low low hangar height so you can't get cranes in so really we come up with devices other methods and we uh, affectionately call them skates and in the right hand picture you can see underneath one of the main wheels there we've got this big skate um, really all we've done there is jack up the aircraft uh, get the main wheels clear of the ground slip the skates in underneath, put the casters on and the casters then allow us to move it wherever we want. Uh, they are both the main wheels are connected and then we connect up a turf or winch and that allows us to um, just move the airplane at our will wherever we want. Just keeping an eye out on uh, ceiling heights in uh, nasty corners and things like that. Typically on a, on a turf or winch for every pump you get about one inch of movement so you can see how much hard work it is. And again, when you start moving over tired surfaces, um, if it's on a hot day, this cast just starts sinking in. So it's not it's not a simple task. It's a lot of heavy manual hot work for the team. Um, lucky enough, we don't have to do too much of it, but uh, we have the capability when we uh, when we have to. Uh, unfortunately, and it's probably one of my one of my pet hates. I've got a couple of pet hates with with working and that's having an aircraft outside. Um, aircraft being metal, uh, the majority of them being metal don't just like the external uh, condition to uh, the British weather. And as you can see there, this is Bristol Britannia that we have outside and we spent, um, I think best part of two years, just uh, restoring a lot of, uh, repairing a lot of the work on, on, on this aeroplane. And there's some examples there of the deterioration that we found. Uh, yeah, so it's great. Hard work for us, um, but not great to see for the public. If you can see an aircraft left outside, uh, it looks like they're not being looked after. They are, it's just the weather is just, happen so fast and the deterioration on these aeroplanes happen so fast sorry with the weather um, it's, it's difficult for us to keep up really the only one thing to do is to put them inside and so there's my number one middle moan and pet hate about uh, trying to look after an aircraft collection of course uh, it's not always aircraft outside um, that they're on display sometimes some of our aircraft inside do have these issues um, 
and that's generally because they've spent time outside during their operational career on the left hand side there what we've got is a uh, main undercarriage door for the um, valiant aircraft uh, and what you've got there as you can see there's a section of the bracket missing you've got a dissimilar metal going on on there you've got an aluminium casting and a, a mild steel bolt and you've set up a little electrolysis between the two and that causes the corrosion um, so what have we done there we've replaced the bracket uh, with a new bracket and tends to because she's never going to mention earlier never going to fly again we tend to ream it out a little bit extra and give it a little bit of play just to cut down and grease it up well so stop uh, any future corrosion on the right hand side there you've got the geodetic structure from a Vickers Wellington again a little bit of light oxidation going on there nothing too severe just a bit of a rough pad something like a scotch pad uh, to rub that off and then a, a coating of um, uh, top coat on top uh, and varnish type product something like that will just uh, control the corrosion there basically the simplest way to cut the uh, stop corrosion is to stop the air getting to it if you don't have air you, you typically don't get corrosion <clears throat> some of the other issues that we found as well uh, is with undercarriages and engine fittings and some of these like the engine fitting on the right there is typically about 70 years old uh, that's an engine mount uh, or a Merlin engine, so a Merlin engine with propeller, you've got about a mom uh, moment of about one ton acting through that point, so a hell of a lot of weight when you times uh, the weight by distance and things like that. Yeah, going back to school, ho hopefully not racking your brains too much with what I'm on about there. Um, so yes, we have to be very, very careful. In the right-hand side where I've circled, you can see there's a crack coming up through the undercarriage. There's been an interesting uh, bit of information that was passed to me we had another failure on a towing point on, on an aircraft just so happened to have a visitor from Nottingham University they did I got to uh, meet through a, a couple of projects and she put me onto uh, their metallurgy department to quite nicely come out to us uh, have a little look at our issue and took some samples of the undercarriage leg away and the easiest way I read it and to explain it um, if you were to make a cup of coffee now leave it on the, on the side for about a week you get separation you get your coffee layer, you get your milk layer, you get your water layer. Now, if you think that in, into a casting, uh, when these castings were made, your main element being the aluminium, but you got all your trace elements like your sinks, your carbons, and other things being put in, uh, all mixed into the pot, all heated up, making this casting. But what they're saying to me is now over the years, these, these trace elements are saying bye bye and forming their own little groups and layers. Um, even though it's just we're talking microscopic level, it's obviously taking the weakness, uh, the strength from the, the undercarriage and putting weaknesses in. I'm hoping this is down to an odd, odd occasion and not too much. I've got 70, 80 aircraft that are probably of this vintage uh, out there, which potentially could be causing us this, this sort of problem. So obviously this is something that um, these two things that we're sort of looking at all the time just to make sure uh, we're not missing anything. Uh, we do a lot of suspended air, uh, aircraft within the museum. Um, and these are the sort of things here, uh, condition of it, saying weight, certain weight of the aircraft that we're going to put it up and where they're going to suspend it from. Interestingly, uh, uh, modern day aircraft are that little bit more simple to actually suspend than uh, World War II airplanes. And there's some of the ones we've got on display. Um, there's a Lightning there, vertical, which is, if you know much about the Lightning, that was typically how it, what used to happen, take off down the runway, stick her into full reheat up, she would go straight up like that. And that's why we decided to mount the object like that. But then on the right hand side as well, you've got these jaunty angles for the Hunter and the Sabre. Uh, and just to add complications to the suspension process, uh, we've been added in a, a new material for us in, in the museum world. The, the center photograph is a Predator uh, UAV uh, down on display at our Hendon site. Of course, the majority of this is made from carbon fiber. So again, this is a new material. We were used to working with woods, we're used to working with metals, but we're just seeing objects coming in now with carbon fiber, which is all certainly for myself when I was in the RAF and certainly never worked with anything to do with uh, composite structures. So it's, it's more learning for uh, my team uh, just to make sure we know how to look after these objects in, uh, uh, for the future. What else we do then? Fabric work. Um, again, I've tried to work this out and it's very, very difficult to work out how many people in the UK are actually qualified or still qualified in doing this work on a regular basis. Um, I have one uh, technician so if it's finished technician who does this work, not only does he does the painting and stuff like that, but he's actually doing the Irish linen. And again, we're using the original products that were used in the day, built from the same, uh, to the same specifications. Um, totting it up, uh, if I'm probably generous, I'd say there's probably five people in the UK. It probably is even less than that, that are doing this at uh, any, any one time. So it is a really much a skill that uh, Clive's got, uh, my surface finish technician. 
just to show you a little bit more that's the irish linen there um being a bit crude it's almost like having a, a one of your t-shirts and that's what it starts out up comes on a roll um you can see the needles the needles are used for putting the thread through uh, normally on a structure underneath you'll zip it through underneath uh, and then pull it through and if you look on the right hand photo uh, there's two two sections there the top one is where the uh, iris linen has been doped so it's gone taut it's tightened typically it takes about four coats of dope and you can see the fabric strips which has gone over the the stitching and then the bottom photos you might just be able to make out little knots and that's what that fabric patch is uh, protecting the little knots of string whether it's been tied to the structure underneath uh, the silver coating is one of the coatings it has after it's had the doping. It has um, uh, UV and microwave protection for flying up at altitude and to protect the air crews as well. Uh, sometimes you have flying uh, parts of the flying controls or other systems that come through and then we end up putting on these leather patches. Again, most of this work is exact replica of what would have happened uh, when these aircraft were flying. Um, one of the issues you have with things like our Irish linen, uh, it's, it's a natural product, so very much like your rubbers in, on your tyres and your cottons, it tends to dry out in a, in a drier atmosphere, i.e. inside in a hangar. And so that's what tends to happen, it dries out, it goes very thin, it goes like a paper, and you can just flick, literally flick, flick it in, it will break on you. So at times we've had to prepare. So the idea really is to get in, get a new coat on, and hopefully, fingers crossed, it will be good for another 30 to 50 years. Where do we work? I keep mentioning about the sites. Um, I've actually put three sites because we've got two open to the public, the London stroke Hendon site and the Cosford site in the West Midlands. But also we have a reserve collection and we do work up there. That, the reserve collection is at Stafford. Uh, one of the things the museum is looking at at the moment is moving the uh, reserve collection from the Stafford site uh, to possibly a resource hub as it's being known at the Cosford site. So again, more building work and expansion at the Cosford site. So yes, we work at all three museum sites and um, we work with other museums and aviation groups. Being a national museum, uh, some of our objects are out on loan and it's my, and my team's responsibility to make sure if, they, if they've got objects on loan from us that they are looking after them and giving them the exact care that we would do. So it allows us to get out and about um, and go and visit these other museums uh, and generally get a good look around it, what objects they've got uh, as well. Nice, nice to keep in contact with these other museums and gain if they're if they're after information about an object, uh, whether it's technical information or how we've done some work before, we're always willing to help them out. Um, uh, it's, it's something that's part of our remit as a national museum for us to uh, help and talk with others and form relationships. <coughs> uh, that's Mick, who used to be our painter down there, and by the look of the round, I would suggest he's working on a Japanese aeroplane there, uh, just putting some finishing touches. Top right, you've got a bolt and pull defined. Um, Looking at that paint scheme, I'm suggesting she's just been delivered uh, to uh, Medway Aircraft Preservation Society Maps in Kent, who at one time were working with us in doing some restoration projects uh, for the museum. The, the Bolton Paul Defiant uh, has been finished and she's on display now at Cosford. And worldwide as well, um, I say a lot of our dealings are with national museums in other countries. Uh, just recently I've had a little chat with the uh, World War II Museum in uh, New Orleans where I gave them a, an online uh, chat about the work that we do uh, on an aircraft that I'm going to cover in a, in a short while. So yes, we've had a lot of dealings with a lot of big American museums and a lot of the big European museums as well. <clears throat> the other thing, and I put this on there, where do we work? And I think it's uh, important that yes, we do work in public areas and where possible, I've always encouraged my team, if a member of the public wants to know a little bit more about the work that you're doing, providing it's safe, to do so, i.e. not halfway through lifting, doing a lifting operation or forklifting operation, and they want to know a little bit more about who you are and what you're doing and to the aeroplane, where it's going, that sort of stuff. I'm more than happy for my team to get engaged uh, with the people, have a little chat and just uh, give them the information they're after. In the end, we're there as a museum and our role is to make sure visiting uh, members of the public go away with as much information they can on the museum. And I think that's one way as a team that we can help, uh, help out. So just getting on to who's doing all this work. We're not a big team. Uh, taking into consideration the apprentices, there's uh, 17 of us on the paid staff side. Uh, but I, as well, at both sites, we rely heavily on uh, volunteers. At the Cosford, I think the number I've got on the, this is just engineering conservation team, is 57 to be exact. Um, sadly, like very much like myself, I haven't seen most of them uh, for quite a while now because uh, we've all been on a coronavirus lockdown 
I should have mentioned earlier, actually, I am working from home. You probably gathered. Uh, it doesn't look like I'm in an office. And uh, uh, as you all know, working from home, if, uh, it's been day for us. So if you hear my dogs barking or if the postman comes to the door, you're likely to hear them barking. So apologies in advance if anything like that happens. So, yes, uh, I have a lot of uh, very, very dedicated volunteers. Uh, and I think last last year they were somewhere around about 20,000 free man hours given to the uh, museum, which is an incredible amount. So just to talk a little bit more about the work that they do. And if again, if you've been to Cosford, we, we, I divided the teams up into areas. So some of them working in hangars two, three, four, external, things like that. And typically we're not there just to strip an airplane down. Now we've got a maintenance schedule, which is a, a check um, every three months, which really is just going around having a good look at the airplane. We do look at the objects when we're walking past them all the time, to be honest. And then annually we'll do a little bit more where we'll take off an odd panel and just have a little look inside for further deterioration. Typically, we'll, when we're doing the annual inspections, we'll just do one side. So maybe in a, an odd year, we do the, um, uh, so if it's, what's it, 2020 this year, so that's uh, an even number. So we'll do the port side, most likely on an aeroplane, have a quick look around. If we find anything wrong, we'll have a look on the starboard side. In 2021, we'll do the starboard side and vice versa. If there's anything wrong, we'll have a look on the port side. So rather than just keep ripping the aeroplanes a bit every 12 months and finding nothing, we're just sort of, condensing the servicing just to get out of it what we can. Um, apprenticeship scheme as well, there's a little bit more about the volunteer work that they're doing towards the end as well. Yes, we've run a very, very successful apprenticeship scheme, which has been going now since 2005. Uh, I'm not gonna bore you with uh, the qualifications, things like that, but if you know any, any individuals that are interested in doing an engineering apprenticeship scheme, uh, we're just about to uh, get the uh, candidates through for this year just sit through their uh, applications and interviewing in a week or so's time which again will be over the internet so again a first for me uh, but they're, they're with us on a three-year apprenticeship and come out with uh, level three qualifications after the part there's no jobs for them at the end we do make that very very clear at the interview photograph in the middle there is Jim who's not one of my apprentices uh, he's one of my volunteers uh, who's been working in in the main hangar on uh, Hamden and actually there he's working on the Volks and the Vulcan telcones and that's Rebecca who is our, one of my very first apprentices back in 2005 so it seems only like five minutes ago. At the bottom there it's worth uh, mentioning the international exchange uh, over the years we've done a lot of exchanges with our apprentices uh, out to uh, America uh, various areas they've been to um, Seattle uh, been to Washington to work and things like that. So just more recently, uh, last couple of times, they've been to um, Boda, uh, to a museum in Norway. Uh, actually, John, who's on listening, uh, I think was the mentor that took the two apprentices out to Boda just recently where they went out and did some work out there for a week. Just to show you, when I was uh, went as the mentor, um, just to give you an idea of what the, the apprentices, and I think... Uh, Martin and Nathan, uh, my, my two apprentices on the right-hand photo, the two lads at the back, the gentleman in the right, uh, the yellow shirt at the front, it's Brian. He was uh, sponsored by Boeing from, uh, and he was from Brisbane in Australia and he joined us for the tour. We were actually in uh, America for three weeks. We started off in Seattle at Boeing, um, which included about 10 or 11 days looking around all the vast Boeing site. Uh, then we spent a couple of days on a flying, uh, with a flying team, and that's Martin there in the middle doing a, quick check on the engines and also while they're up in the Seattle area they were doing some evening work where they were doing some composite work learning how to uh, do composite structures uh, a lot of that work, work involves using vacuum uh, technology as well again which is something I've never been involved with uh, we had a couple of days then working in uh, Philadelphia again some more tours of the Boeing factories which is the helicopter wing couple of days spare and went around uh, we were in Washington and then we ended up in the photograph which is on the right hand side there and that's at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida and that's uh, the space shuttle discovery behind us uh, so you know there's 19 20 year olds these young lads were getting exposed to um, some quite uh, high level uh, visits um, very very privileged to be part of the tour and I mentioned about the the weather photo in the, in the middle where Martin is working on a b25 uh, airplane there she goes that's the one we were working on of course what happens then you chucked on board to have a flight on the flight test so we had a 40 minute uh, flight up or up to the Canadian border and back from Seattle so again something else that will stick in my memory I've had a flight in a Jaguar and a B-25 Mitchell airplane I'm just missing a Spitfire Hurricane type thing and a World War One biplane to get my uh, my logbook complete <laughs> 
Uh, again, over the years, we've been very, very fortunate that uh, we've had national recognition for our apprenticeship scheme. Um, 2010, we entered uh, the national awards. Uh, there are three categories, small, medium, large. We entered in the, the small category, and that's all based on the number of employees. Um, we walked away as the small category winner as the best apprenticeship scheme. 2011 we entered again and uh, they whispered at us we've never given it to anybody for two years running and they gave us second uh, it was actually a chip shop apprenticeship scheme for in Skegness uh, uh, that won it that year which was, I thought was absolutely great I was telling everybody we were battered by a chip shop so, uh, but again as you can see we had a win and gain in 2012 and um, that was Laura who was our carpenter apprentice at the time we entered her into the individual uh, apprenticeship award and there was only one title and she walked away as a winner and over the years, we've worked very uh, closely with the Rotary Club of uh, Wolves and various other people. And so we've had a lot of recognition over the years for our, uh, the work that we're doing. Uh, I put it down to um, good mentors, good teaching, good environment to work, good work. You're working on old objects, things like that. But most importantly as well, uh, the youngsters, uh, men and uh, young men and ladies that we've had on the scheme are actually at a bench using their hands, building things, filing, cutting metals and this sort of thing, welding, that sort of stuff. So, you know, very, very practical apprenticeship scheme rather than being just stuck in, in an office and behind a desk or in a computer all day. And I think that goes and helps a lot. Uh, with their development if they want to be an engineer you can only learn so much in a classroom on a computer but physically getting them out there to do the work and that's why they shine most of them that have left us now are working in the aviation industry uh, and a lot of the youngsters or i call them youngsters now the ones that were in the early days from when we first started now starting to work their way into uh, lower levels of management as well so it's great to see other things that we do and very much like i'm doing this morning is outreach that's me there with uh, Ginny buckley filming an episode of Escape to the Country, uh, and that's a Hamden aircraft behind, which uh, I'll give you a bit more information on in a bit later. So yes, a lot of outreach. We go out talking to people. I do a lot of talks around the world. I'm hoping to add America to my list uh, next year. I've been possibly invited to a conference out there if it happens in January to give a talk. So yes, uh, pr promoting the museum by a bit of outreach. So really now I'm gonna come on to the nuts and bolts and the spanners of everything that we're doing. Just got to uh, talk you through some of the projects we've been involved with. This is our, uh, our London site. Uh, we spent as a team the best part of three years stripping and moving a lot of objects around uh, down there. And this is really the first hangar. This is an introduction to the Air Force. And the bottom left photo is what you were greeted when you move in, uh, first walk into the building, is a wall of hats. Sounds a bit odd, but um, there's 80 hats, all different ones from all RAF background hats as well. So uh, history of the RAF in hats. It's quite incredible uh, display, really. I, I think it's very, very original and different. But then when you get in, as you can see, the main thing in there is it's not just large aeroplanes and things like that. We've got missiles, ejection seats, we've got vehicles, we've got display cases. And we're talking about the complete RAF. The RAF is not just uh, aeroplanes and pilots and engineers. But also in, the, in this area as well, you can see there's development zones for kids to come and learn, adults as well, or if you want to as well, I suppose, uh, about technology to do with aviation and things like that. And there's a lot of computer stuff for them to get involved with. If you can just make out in that top right hand picture, I've just noticed it for the first time, there's a red arrow gnat, which is on a, a pole looking like it's just about to fly down the middle. I hadn't noticed that before. The bottom right hand photo, we spoke about uh, the suspension, and this is the Hangar 6 at Hendon which is uh, the modern day uh, Air Force really sort of uh, after the Cold War, uh, after the um, oh, a Gulf War, I'll get the name right, uh, period. So we've got in there Jaguar, Tornado, Buccaneer, Harrier GR9 and a Typhoon. But again, as well, as you can see in dispersed around the objects is all the display cases. So a lot of that work with a lot of those objects moves were carried out by my team, um, not just around the Hendon site, but between our uh, Stafford and Cosford sites as well. We were heavily involved uh, in 2018, crack, just over two years ago now, the RF celebrated its centenary. And the, R the RF were going on a tour uh, to promote the RF and tell everybody and remind everybody that we were 100 years old. And we were invited to turn up at the tours and we ended up at the place you can see there. And when you see Newcastle, that's actually Newcastle in Northern Ireland, um, not the Newcastle up in the northeast of uh, England. So yes, we went out and about. We'd loaned an RAF, uh, the RAF uh, uh, Harrier which is hidden actually, but the one my team were building for this sort with Snipe, which is uh, an interwars uh, era plane. So we were going out and building this for the public to see. As you can see, there's a helicopter, typhoon, 
I said, we have got our, our Harry and I'm sure it must be hidden in the shop by the, uh, the nose of the, uh, the aircraft there. So again, yeah, we were popping out, having meeting the public and getting to build aircraft in front of them in, in city centres generally. Uh, this is the Cardiff, uh, the build, which is the very, very first one. Also as well on the 10th of July uh, and, and a few days leading up to that, the RAF took over Horse Guards Parade in London, um, where we had a lot of aeroplanes throughout the uh, 100 years on display for the public to come and see. Of course, being in Horse Guards Parade, you got a lot of international visitors. But the main day was the 10th of July, even though the birthday was on the 1st of April. I think they learned from the fact that the weather in the UK um, is likely to be better in July. Not that you believe it at the moment outside here in Telford where I live. It's um, pretty abysmal for July, but again, 10th of July, and it was an absolute smashing day in 2018. And the day started off with a Westminster Abbey uh, church service. And you can see in the top right photo there, apologies to the quality, not the best, but the, the seat was just missing Her, Her Majesty the Queen. And I was very, very fortunate to have a, um, uh, a ticket uh, with our CEO to go and be in this part of Westminster Abbey. Uh, and then from there, we ended up going uh, onto All Scars Parade. And uh, mo most people will remember what I'm just going to show you now. This is all on TV. And you could just look at the mouth. Thousands and thousands of people that came out to see the flyover. Um, again, being on Horse Guards Parade and not having the benefit of being able to see TV screens, I really couldn't see what the RAF regiment and the display team were doing there in front of their Her Majesty, forming the RAF 100 and all the, all the other um, marching things that were going on. Um, but again, let's hope, fingers crossed, that this plays. Uh, this is something that I filmed. Yes, there you go. So yes, I say, so we built a lot of aeroplanes uh, to go on to uh, Horse Guards Parade. I just realized the other week, and I haven't had a, had a chance to add them in yet, maybe able to get a couple of photos of the aeroplanes that we built on the Horse Guards Parade. But me, I ended up going into Buckingham Palace for a, a, a reception for a couple of hours. So that was on the, the Tuesday, I think it was. And on the, the Thursday, I'm back in overalls on Horse Guards Parade in about 30 degrees of heat, absolutely thick with dust and sweating. Uh, stripping airplanes down to get them off horse guards parade i think we had to have it finished by the saturday morning which we did so rags to riches uh, certainly for me in that uh, in, a, in a couple of days and again at the same time uh, with all this going on the lord mayor of london uh, heard about the rf centenary decided <coughs> excuse me just need a quick drink voice is back to pop yeah so a lot so saying the lord mayor of london uh, got to hear about the uh, RF Centenary and wanted to hold a VVIP, which meant Royal uh, Banquet at London's Guild Hall. And again, the RF jumped on the bandwagon and we ended up uh, putting some aircranes through the uh, ages on them. Uh, my team, again, were working on uh, and we built these Spitfires and Hurricane Plints, actually. We already had the uh, aeroplanes there, our external ones at Hendon. So we'd given them a servicing a, a, and a new lick of paint uh, before we put them on display at Hendon. We were asked to put them on the Horse Guards Parade, uh, sorry, uh, Guild, London Guildhall uh, grounds. What I hadn't realised when we were looking into this task, because it's, it's a big open area, but there's underneath there's a Roman amphitheatre, so weight limits uh, meant restrictions on when you could bring cranes and things like that. You could only have one crane on there at a time. I think our slot to go in to do the build because there was a restrictions on lorries during the week till about 7, 7.30 in the evening. I think our, our time slot was something like one o'clock in the morning, but it was more two, three o'clock before the, the guys actually got on there to start their work. So again, very much thanks to my team that were there for working through the night on a task like this. Um, interestingly, when they offered us the Sunday slot, they offered us the very, very first one, which I thought, yeah, we, we had the last slot for build. Let's have the first one for strip. It was only when my guys phoned me up and said, hey, you do realise uh, we just arrived back down here on the, on the Sunday. Uh, there's not the same restrictions on the lorries, um, only to find out that it had been uh, the London Marathon that day. So you can imagine the many thousands of people that were in that area. Uh, that time so really difficult for my guys to get in and do the work but again we did we got them out and they're both now on on display at the uh, London site as gate guardians one on the pedestrian entrance and one on the uh, vehicle entrance getting more onto the actual real objects as well that we've been involved with and this was something that was sort of sat there when I first joined the museum 15 years ago Sopworth uh, Dolphin which is Sopworth's very very first water-cooled engine aeroplane it's a biplane um, a lot of the fuselage there but we had to uh, 
get on and manufacture the wings. Yeah, I've got another photo there. Very fortunate we have been able to get hold of the technical drawings from that era and the, the technical drawing in the middle is the brackets that attach, uh, metal brackets that attach onto the lower wings, similar ones onto the upper wings that allow the inter wing struts to go. But as you can see there, a newly fabricated piece of a uh, wing section there. Top left is showing you the Spana uh, I think it's a V12 engine. I can't remember the capacity, but it throws out around about 200 brake or something like that. So huge engine, not a great deal of output compared to modern day technology. The wing next thing would happen to the wing then, it would off, go off to the paint shop and um, have fabric uh, covering and then be repainted. Other things that we had to get involved with was the interrupter gear on the left-hand photo and then obviously the rebuild inside and that's the cockpit area. Beautiful uh, craftsmanship going on in there. Typically the aircraft were built to a very high standard, even in the early days, because uh, in the early days there was no such thing. It was it really in its infancy, the aircraft uh, trade. And most of the people that were employed to build aircraft were furniture cabinet makers. So were very, very skilled people that were coming in, into the industry. And that's the finished object there, the Sopla Sniper. Um, that's a photo at uh, Cosford site before we stripped her and took her down to Hendon. Uh, some people have asked me about the photo, is it, is it a model? It, I can guarantee you it's not a model. Uh, but every photo we, we could find of the SOP was when we were trying to replicate a photo, always showed it on grass. Um, this was taken in January, so we didn't want to put a brand new shiny airplane on grass. So we put some camo matting, uh, netting down and took the photo on there. Uh, but I guarantee you that that is, that is a real airplane on display at the Hendon site now. Another very interesting task we got involved with, and I think it first came to us around about 2011. Uh, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office uh, contacted the museum and said, uh, we'd like, uh, if possible, for you to support um, a British trade fair in, in Kuwait. And what we're after is something British iconic engineering. Of course, straight away, the first thing that comes to our heads then would be a Spitfire. And we're very fortunate we had this PR-19 uh, in our reserve collection, as you can see, there's no engine fitted, so we had to uh, gather an engine from elsewhere to fit on her. But really, the task of the team was to rebuild this airplane. She was going overseas, so we stripped and made her as light as possible. We did we did have to fit the engine. She was missing a, an elevator, and that's what you can see being manufactured by one of the staff uh, to go on the back end for the airplane. But yes, we ended up going out to Q8, and, and that's her built in a uh, shopping mall in Q8 City. Once until we got out there that we realised the other British iconic engineering were McLaren cars, as you can see there in the background. Interesting to see for when I went out there, um, I was on the, the, the strip of the airplane. We popped over to have a little look during the day, and, and the Q80s that were there were more interested in seeing a Spitfire than they were the McLaren cars, which was always nice to see. So yes, uh, an interesting task. And it sort of built from there. We uh, were due to bring the airplane back home. Uh, BA Systems uh, were trying uh, to sell on their Typhoon fighter aircraft in the Middle East. So they invited us to join their tours to the air shows. We ended up going to various places, and that's the Allen Air Show in the UAE photograph that I took. Um, and you can see obviously the red arrows going over the top. Interesting, if you like your air shows and you like mad air shows, that was the one to go to. Uh, some of the low flying there was incredible. Uh, but then over a desert where you don't have obstructions, uh, I suppose you can get away with it. And very very hot as well uh, but also that didn't stop we ended up doing a couple of visits uh, to Bahrain and this is on the second visit uh, to, to Bahrain we went out there with BA Systems uh, working a lot with the schools out there and, and STEM STEM activities to get the kids inspired to become into the STEM uh, engineering that sort of thing and over the years but ended up spending six months in the Bahrain National Museum time for me to have another quick drink now so hopefully quick click and I'll show you how to build a Spitfire
Okay, I don't work my team that hard. That was obviously time lapse uh, uh, photography going on there. Um, and as you can see, um, there was only two two members of my team out there for that build. I, I think that's all we sent out. Uh, the, the rest are um, local contractors from Insight, but obviously there was a lot of youngsters there. And whenever we go to uh, somewhere like Q8 or Bahrain or the UAE, we always speak with the local colleges and try and get some of the youngsters involved. It's one that helps them with their, their college work and their understanding and gives them a unique opportunity to work on something iconic like a Spitfire, but also it makes great publicity for them and the place that they work. Nothing to do with us, in the, uh, we're just there in the background, but we're just giving them all this advice. Uh, it's, it was built over about three days and that gives them the chance to learn. Typically with my team, if I can have four guys on the team and four to six hours and we've got that aircraft built, we're just very, very proficient at building it. Uh, if you want to just know a little bit more technical information, it's in the mites in blue. This is a PR, so it's photo reconnaissance Spitfire. Uh, no guns, it's, uh, it's armament, if you want to call it, is speed and altitude. So really it would just get in, get some photographs, get high, get fast, get home. Um, places like the way the guns would have been fitted is, is for them to carry extra fuel. So yeah, and as you can see there, double royal visit uh, just before we went out to uh, bring the aircraft back. Battle of Britain 80, um, we were due to visit all the locations you can see on there. Uh, it was gonna be a West Midlands uh, plus tour. Actually, I need to update that slide as well because right at the last minute we had Wrexham come on board. But again, with coronavirus uh, hitting us this year, that had to be totally canceled. And we were looking at taking uh, this Spitfire, Spitfire 16, uh, around to all those locations for weekends just to talk to people about the Battle of Britain and just say make them aware that oops, sorry make them aware that it was not uh, fought over the skies of Kent uh, it happened in the whole of the UK uh, was involved as well um, at the moment not 100% certain but uh, there's sort of talks that maybe next year we'll do it uh, again next uh, next spring early summer so again, if you live in close to any of those locations, keep a look out in the press or on the museum website. Uh, you may see a Spitfire uh, being built in your city centre or equivalent location at uh, some point. This is one of the earlier tasks in FE2B, again, a First World War uh, aeroplane. And uh, we've got one in the collection and they come up this photograph and they asked me, of uh, in my uh, days before I become the manager, with my apprentice car, if we could look at manufacturing the uh, the bomb rack that you can see on there so yeah no problem give me the drawings yeah great had no drawings but we did come up with the 250 pound uh, bomb uh, drawing and that one dimension uh, if you can see it on the just forward on the lower uh, photo of the uh, green band just forward of that there's 10 inches and, and that gave us one indication and by finding some other photos of it fitted to uh, an fe2b we could scale that uh, that we had that one dimension that allowed us to scale everything we can get it then probably about 95% plus accurate um, by taking all the measurements and building stuff. And again, being an object, we wanted it to uh, be fitted uh, inside the object uh, uh, as a working object, sorry. So we made the internal mechanism as well based on this other drawing that we'd found. Uh, she is suspended it and uh, above people. So in where it says figure two at the bottom, you can see the actuating arm. We put a little gag in there. So even though it's out, out, out of reach of anybody, the uh, lever cannot be pulled and the bomb cannot be deployed. And the final result, that's it before she was uh, went up into the roof. That's what uh, me and the apprentice manufactured. And so I think it looks very, very similar to uh, what, were, what we were shown in the early days, uh, in, in that early days photo. Another very, very interesting task for us. And sometimes some of these objects are just too large, too big for us to be involved with and take up too much time. So we went out with contracts. We do work with a lot of uh, external companies as well. And this is GJD Engineering, uh, who stripped uh, the VC-10. Unfortunately, uh, it's on display at Cosford, but the Cosford runway was too short uh, for the aircraft to land uh, at Cosford site. So she ended up uh, going to Brundingthorpe uh, and was stripped down into sections there. And this is coming through on a Sunday morning uh, through a local village uh, called Shifnorn in through the back gate at the Cosford site. Very, very fortunate for rear wheel steering and the, uh, the, uh, the skill of these uh, companies that move these sort of objects to be able to get us down, which ended up the little track she's turning onto on the left photo is nothing more than about nine, 10 foot wide with fen a fence on one side and uh, the skill. So we got her on site. Eventually got her built uh, on our display car park and, and entrance to the museum. Now, this is what I'm greeted with or anybody that turns up at the museum every day. 
one of my favorite airplanes the um uh the vc10 back so yes getting on to the uh wellington and this is the wellington structure um very very unique structure uh, and there were there are about two or three aircraft that were built this uh type of configuration it's known as geodetic and probably the easiest way to think about it it's um an uh uh, a fixed wing aircraft being built from an airship uh, and it was designed by the legendary designer Barnes Wallace of Banksing bomb fame so certainly not going to argue but the limitations became the fabric control you can only go so fast uh, and pull so many G's uh, on, on fabric uh, after that you have to go to the metal yeah, anyway a bit, a bit disconcerting to get in your Airbus or Boeing and find out it had a, a fabric covering and not a metal covering so yes uh, an absolute brilliant aeroplane it came um it was the only actual bomber that was on bomber command for the full duration of the war. The other bigger bombers like the Lancaster come in after the war had started. So numbers, 11, 11, it's 11,462, I think is the exact figure. So I say just short of 11,500 of these aircraft were manufactured. So just to give you an indication how uh, rare they are, there's this one and there's one uh, in the Brooklyn's Museum, uh, uh, just short of down by Heathrow, Weybridge, that sort of area. So yes, a uh, very, very rare object in the aviation uh, industry and the museum, certainly in the museum world. But again, we're looking at uh, refabricating this aircraft completely and getting it back out on display. And this is one of the projects my volunteers are, are probably more heavily involved in um, on a day-to-day -day basis in my team. And there's an original photograph we had of the aeroplane uh, back in 1953. She was the last ever flying Wellington, we're led to believe. And also we're, we believe that if you've ever watched the Dan Buster's film, uh, the great legendary film. Uh, there's a, some shots of a Wellington doing some trials with the uh, bouncing bombs off Chesil Beach. And um, we believe it is this aeroplane as well. So really, she's not so much of a war hero. She did go on one operation towards the end of the war, but her role uh, really was a uh, TV star. Hence why she survived. And uh, if she'd have been an early version or an early built Wellington, uh, unfortunately, she most likely wouldn't be in the condition she is in nowadays. Another project we've got going on now, and again another fabric covered airplane, is the beautiful Lysander. Uh, it was brought up from uh, on display at Hendon, and she's due to go back. Now she's nearing completion to Hendon uh, around about a 12 months time. Interesting as well. Uh, this is the original aircraft, and on the right hand side, you've got the original some original photos uh, of her when she was in her operational days. And you can interesting um, and see the uh, little red bit that I've circled there. Uh, on the right hand photo and you can notice the cooling gills this uh who's ever rebuilt them has not built them uh, properly they put them on the that, that's a black and camouflage uh scheme by then you can see the camouflage one is lower in the black when they should be the other way around so when we put her on display uh, we have original photo we're going to replicate that because that's how she was one day so that's what we're building her to um the fuel tank and the ladder that you can see underneath uh, are in manufacture at the moment so at some point if not, uh, when she first goes on display at some point, she will have both fitted as well. Another thing we've got going on, um, our apprentices have to do a lot of work for their MVQ, that's the hands-on side of their apprenticeship scheme, is uh, with one of our senior technicians, we've got them uh, assisting him to build a Spitfire cockpit. And this is the uh, cockpit uh, on display, uh, ready uh, to go on display soon and um, being built. Uh, it's gonna be a sit-in, uh, uh, we've designed it that way and again, Compared to a normal aircraft, it would be quite low to the, uh, to the ground, so it will open it up to people that possibly can't climb onto wings or are not very good at climbing. And certainly, the younger kids, uh, their parents will be able to help and guide them to sit in, so they'll be able to get the, the feel from an early age what it would have been like to be a pilot to uh, sit in a Spitfire. So, apart from that, she's all replica, there's no other uh, health and safety issues. We will have a seat in there soon that's been manufactured at the moment, so yes, a chance to actually get to sit, to get to sit and feel what it's like to have a canopy over your head. Uh, have a Spitfire experience. Again, it's getting on to a little bit more uh, about the TSR2 works and some of this is my, I mentioned about one of the, my pet hates and there's another one of my pet hates coming up on, on this aeroplane in, in, in a short while. But when my volunteers were doing uh, some of their inspections, we decided to go a little bit further on some of the panels and we took off the, the rear flying control panels and this is a big stub mounting that you can see there. Uh, the outer bearing in nut is being uh, left off and uh bits of wood they've used oak so fair play to them they've ever put it on but obviously totally inappropriate to use bits of oak when uh, the proper bearing should be in and fitted so um, what my volunteer team have done is worked and that's what it looks like inside now uh when when we uh do replica parts um 
the actual bearing that went in, we actually had a spare, so the original bearing's gone back in, but uh, the bearing, the, the big plate on you can see in the nuts have been painted red. These are pieces that are not original items, so in years to come, if anybody was to look inside and wonder why, and there's no one around to explain to them what's gone on, even though we'll have the record of the work, um, we put this uh, red paint on to identify to people that it's not original parts fitted in there. But the good thing is now we know that that's safe and it's not going to uh, come off whenever we're moving the aeroplane around. And just to show you my next pet tape, this is the fin. Interesting, this is a huge, big one piece moving fin. Um, again, we've got to do a similar operation to what's happened before. We need some staging up so we can get in to have make sure the fins been fitted correctly. But uh, I call it vandalism, and I really do not understand why anybody would want to put a bracket on like that one you can see there. Uh, to me, the logical thing is if you want to put some bracket on, you move it two inches back and you pick up on the existing holes, you just remove them, put the brackets over those fasteners drill to fit and screw the fasteners back in quite simple but why they had to drill holes into original structure i really really just do not understand that um we will just go up there at some point when we remove these we'll make some appropriate brackets to go over the holes i've already mentioned uh, and uh, put some filler inside and just after some paint and just lose that part of its black history unfortunately and also uh, again i've talked to you a lot about the uh uh, aeroplanes we got a uh, uh, we do look after vehicles as well and we've got this uh trench yard vehicle which again is proving a little bit of a confusion to the museum um, we're trying to gain information so if anybody's got in, any information and the main thing that's causing us confusion this is a 1942 vehicle as you can see from the bottom there uh 1956 uh is when trench yard funeral happened so this old this vehicle is 14 years old which for that sort of period a 14 year old vehicle um uh, to be used seems really an odd thing. We can't find any connections. The family has been uh, looking through the documentation they've got and they can't find any um, connections. So if anybody knows anything uh, about it, please let us know. Uh, so all we've done is, that's the aircraft now, I don't know if I've got one, no, I haven't got one of her on display at the moment. She's actually on public display. Uh, we've done very, very little apart from just sort of make sure she's safe and greased up the joints, uh, things like that. Uh, well, the brakes weren't working, we've just got the handbrake back working so we've got some way of controlling the vehicle when we're moving around but the original paint or the paint that's on there we believe to be original we've just left it alone until we know better we do know there was a restoration work um, done but there's limited information um, on what that we believe looking at what we got it was just done on the engine and the bodywork wasn't touched but until we're 100 percent certain that the bodywork uh, paint is either original or not then then we can make the decision on the way forward so yeah please if you've got info send it to us and, and again, what's something one of my guys are working on and the volunteers have also been working on is, this is inside our Nimrod uh, aircraft, which is a visitor experiencing. You can, uh, one of the few things you can pay for at the museum and actually go inside the aircraft at set times. But what we're looking at doing, the, uh, my volunteer electrician, he's wiring up all these boxes so they're back working. So when you go through, you'll see them all lit up. And um, the Avalon box, you can see on both photographs there, one is original uh, and one has been replicated by one of my guys. And just to give you an indication, if you can't tell the difference, there you go, there's the originals on the left and the replicas on the right. Uh, what else have we got here? And just other things for visitor experience. Just uh, that's a Vicar Valiant again. We showed you the cracking earlier on that bracket. Just by uh, removing the crew door, putting a Perspex screen up and some low wattage lighting inside the BMP a vehicle there and opening up the door on the Victor again lighting just so public can see inside you're not just looking at a, a shaped piece of metal fitting a, over an orifice you're actually getting a look inside and see the crew and it just helps with a, a better understanding of where the pilots and the air crew were sat and interestingly the BMP it's a Czechoslovakian uh, uh, army vehicle the, the two doors you can see at the back quite thick and solid that's actually the fuel tank so I'm not sure I'd like to be inside there being shot at from behind and again, here's another example of what the electricians have been doing. And, and again, with modern technology of using LED lighting uh, and things like that, um, there's a PIR. So as you approach this uh, engine, the engine will fire up and start rotating and the lights will come on. The colder area, the, uh, the chamber where the explosion goes on is a different color. And then the jet pipe exhaust. And you can see the graphic walls there to explain everything that's going on. I think total, it costs something like, 20 to 30 pounds to buy the LED lighting, but the vast difference it makes for the public when they come to see these objects. Got a couple of uh, bigger projects that we've been involved with over the years, and I'm just going to whip through them very, very quickly. Uh, Dornier 17. No Dorniers uh, in, in any museums anywhere in the world. And the Dorniers was one of the mainstays of the German um, bombing campaign uh, during the Battle of Britain. 
Uh, and the one we're looking at here is 1160, group number 1165 KR, took off on the 26th of August with about a dozen other uh, Dornias and was in, met by some Bolton Pool Defiance. Uh, and the Bolton Pool Defiance uh, actually had a good day and shot down quite a few Dornias, including this uh, 5 KR. They actually had 50 uh, Messerschmitt 109s, which the German fighters escorted in the Dornias, and the Defiance put up a hell of a battle. And I think they actually took out quite a few uh, 109s as well. So, yes, a bit of a victory this day. But anyway, this Dornier ended up ditching in the sea just off of um, Ramsgate, about three miles out of the coast of uh, Kent. And there's some underwater scans. It was picked up um, by a trolley. He snagged some nets, his nets on something, told the uh, local dive groups, and they got this scan done. And then the museum started to get involved. Long story then, uh, we got involved in this lifting process of using a frame like this to try and recover off the bottom of the sea. Again, we wanted to try and do the lifts of one and separate. So our simplest little friend, not a lot, as you can imagine, it was never ever going to be that that easy, even though she was only 16 metres down. But um, I said a lot of planning went in, a lot of time out there, and, and the whole of month of May in 2013 was trying to get that um, the airplane lifted. Eventually, um, this did happen. I think that's the last slide it usually is <laughs> yeah so um that's what we recovered uh, and this is the only existing dornier anywhere in the world of uh, any significant there's some small components here in there dotted around museums but yes yeah, so the problem you've got now you've brought it out from the hostile environment the sea into yet another hostile environment the atmosphere and uh, typically corrosion was set in but she would straight away and she would start dissolving so we had to treat this airplane and we had this facility built up at the Cosford site by road, that's a seven hour journey from uh, Ramsgate by lorry up to Cosford. But again, we had this purpose built tunnel where we were super saturating it and we used a citric acid solution to dissolve all the impurities on site. Again, another task that um, I've whipped away in one or two sentences, but the whole process took us something like 20 months to get it cleaned up. And most days we would just continue cleaning out filters and things like that. It was a hell of a mess and a terrible smell as well if you come to visit in the first day. And this is her inside the tunnels without the spray system. On well, the good thing about the spray system and having a recycled system, if we wanted to get in to have a little look, we could just switch it off and pop in and have, have a good look around and uh, put more nozzles if we weren't, uh, if certain areas needed more spray than others. Uh, and that's uh, what she's like after uh, about 20 months of uh, being treated with citric acid. So again, a lot of deterioration, but again, these, these skins are only around about one mil thick. So the erosion, apart from the salt water attacking it, the movement on the bottom of the sea, the tides, currents, suspended sand, all this sort of stuff, continue uh, eroding this airplane away. So I think in the end, we've got um, a fair uh, result from the, uh, the treatment that we put on it. <clears throat> but just to show you some of the smaller objects as well, this is about 90% of this, uh, we, we termed it marine deposit uh, removed, but from that, you can go to that. Again, you've got to be very, very careful. You don't want to disturb and break up anything uh, like the wire, locking wire and stuff like that inside. And also they're recognisable as an engine valve, stripped down and then cleaned up. Again, we don't want it to be back shining. On, on the right hand side there, you can see the carbon deposits on the stem of the valve. We want to leave that on. That's all part of its history. So we've got a lot of these objects, a lot of stuff like that. And again, a lot of that work was done by my apprentices and the volunteers across the site. Coming right to the end now, but another big project uh, uh, that we have going on uh, is a Hamden, and I think it's two weeks today, again at 11 o'clock. Yeah, there we go, 28th uh, at 11 o'clock, I believe. I'm booked again to give you another talk, and I'm going to just talk to you for around about 45 minutes again to an hour about this aircraft, what happened to it, what happened to the crew on board, and introduce you to some of the, uh, the veterans that I've met over the years that have been involved with the Hamden, either through meeting themselves or meeting their families. I so say it's a very, very interesting talk, um, again, this is specific about one object. Um, so what have we got coming up as a team? Uh, we've got the Lysander going to Hendon. We've got the Hamden actually going to Hendon. Fingers crossed we might rerun that Battle of 80 
uh, at all next year. Um, the reserve, the collection, and then the two redevelopments. Hendon's had a lot of work done in the last three, four, five years sort of thing. We're going to be doing finishing off Hendon over the next 10 years. And also there's a huge redevelopment. The new buildings uh, coming to Cosford and there's certainly chat of a big stem hanger uh for for the youngsters for learning and um, for people that want to learn about uh, aeroplanes and things like that so interesting to see what that does happen over the next few years at the cosford site um to say what we wish and what happens is not always the same thing a lot of it comes down to uh the fundraising side but again it would be this great to see the cosford site developed uh, and there's me me and my team plenty of headaches and of how to move aeroplanes and strip them down again but hey it's our job and we love doing it um, if you want to speak to us and see what we're doing, again, at the moment, it, it's on. Um, we have an open week in the NBCC, uh, and dates there, but please do keep a, a look on the website. Obviously, with the coronavirus restrictions out there at the moment, it may not happen, or if it does happen, it may happen in a limited capacity where you have to book tickets in advance. But again, that's something for me to work on with the uh, events team and the uh, management at, at the museum. But again, say, so please just keep a look on the museum. So really, that's uh, me, just a little bit behind the scenes of the stuff that we do. Um, if anybody's got any questions, I'm not sure how we're going to go about answering. If you can type them up or if you can uh, be unmuted, I don't know. But again, um, so from us all at the museum, please join this uh, unprecedented time. Uh, stay safe.